Fund. I've been with the association just a little bit over 20 years. Uh, I do the safety and one of the two people who do the safety and loss control for the association. I've also got Joe Seisky with me. He uh, works primarily on the eastern side. So welcome to Automotive Lift Safety 101. Does that sound like fun? <laughs> How many folks in here have automotive lifts? <laughs> How many of you folks in here have ever dropped a car or heard of somebody that dropped a car? Only from you. Only from me? It's never happened to you. Never happened, but I hear all of you every time. Do you? Good. Well, when we actually did the research and put the presentation together, I asked Joe to go out to the OSHA website and see if he could find any details on statistics as far as the number of claims or how many times cars fall or injuries or et cetera. How many of you guys got golf carts? sales department uses. Do you, would you believe me that we found more statistics and more data on fatalities relating to golf carts than cars falling off a lift? Yeah, I believe that. Surprise me at all. We have all kinds of issues with golf carts around the state. However, when a car falls off a lift, it doesn't happen, maybe it doesn't happen as often, but it's a bigger, grander event. Would you agree with that? Does that get your attention? Has anybody ever had a car fall and nobody underneath it, you were happy nobody got hurt, but would you ever say that that was a good event? No. So at the best situation, when a car falls off a lift, we still got property damage, we still have vehicles laying on the side, we still have to call a customer and say, I'm sorry, sir, you two month old vehicles laying on the side of my shop. Would that make a customer happy? No. How many of you guys have any kind of a training program or do any kind of uh, inspections on your lifts? like maintenance inspections. How often do you have those done? Okay, I've got, I've got a lot of companies that tell me that they do it once a year. I've got a few that tell me that they do it a little more often than that. Uh, most of them tell me they have them inspected when something breaks. Okay, so we're gonna talk about all those kind of issues today. But to get, to get started, just kind of frame up what we're gonna talk about. Uh, safety and automotive lifts, talk about the problem. The problem is, like Barry said, auto lifts don't, incidents involving automotive lifts don't usually result in a small incident. It is the largest potential for fatality to a fixed operations employee. Would you agree? And anybody in here ever heard of somebody being hurt or killed by a car coming off the lift? Okay. Joe's been with us about 15 months. We got him from the Missouri Safety and Health Consultation Service. Prior to that, Joe was a safety and health expert. Compliance officer, I forget what the exact title is, for OSHA out of the St. Louis office. In 2008, there was a GM dealership in St. Louis that dropped a Silverado truck, and the technician was killed when it folded him in half. Joe was the compliance officer that actually uh, worked that case. So at the break, if you guys have any questions or anything, feel free to talk to him. He can tell you kind of what he saw and what they found. So, could you imagine anything that made a better day than that? Property damage. Employee, employee kill, and somebody's got to call the family, talk to the family, right? So, they're easy to become complacent with due to repetitive use by employees. Has anybody in here ever seen a safety latch or a lock that was disengaged with a bungee cord, a wire, a roll of paper, a towel, anything like that? Folks, I'm not bragging, please don't take it this way, but in 22 years, I think I've seen every way humanly possible to disengage your safety latch on the lift, okay? What goes through a technician's mind that that is okay or that's a good idea? I think a lot of it is the simple fact that they've never had an injury before, never had a problem with that lift before, so they assume that they won't. So it's awful easy to become complacent with those. Uh, walk through your shop sometime, see a truck hanging on a lift with the tail about a foot lower than the front, and watch that truck rock because technicians prying on a ball joint with a six foot screwdriver, and you'll kind of see what I mean because okay, they get comfortable with it, they get used to it, they kind of forget what can happen. Lack of employee training on lift operation. Uh, I asked you guys how many folks do training and there's, there were several hands in here. Uh, one of the biggest things that we see going to a dealership 
is I could talk to service manager say, Justin, do you ever, I told you to pick on you from the front row. <laughs> do you ever provide training on your list? Well, yeah, we do orientation, but not so much because he's a technician at another shop. We run into that a lot. There's an assumption that because they use lifts before, they know how to use a lift that they're going to be comfortable with yours, but they're not going to know what your policies, your procedures, or your expectations are. Would you agree with that when they come over? Okay. Uh, failure dealerships to have lifts inspected by qualified inspector, errors in employees, and loading and securing vehicles for a safe lift. Ever had that happen to you? Ever have a technician put a lift? Uh, a truck on a lift and instead of bending down and setting their arms like they're supposed to, they just kind of kick it up underneath there to whatever it grabs and then lift it up because I think the root problem is they assume that cars never going to come off a lift. Do cars only fall off of lifts that are operated by new employees or do they ever fall off of lifts that guys been on the job for 20, 25 years? Sure they do and they can. Okay. Disabling lift safety controls are the problem. Not using the manufacturer's designated lifting points or not knowing where they are. Not knowing where a vehicle center of gravity is or how it balances or not stabilizing a long vehicle after a lift. Okay? We pretty routinely see vehicles on lifts and service departments that we can walk up to the front axle and push it off the lift because of the way that, that vehicle is actually balanced. Okay? Not resting the weight of the load on safety locks instead of using chains, cables, lift cylinders to support the weight of the vehicle, not spotting the vehicle properly, center of gravity shifts, taking the vehicle again, uh, taking the lift in the way the vehicle was raised for granted. So those are kind of some of the things that we're going to talk about today. We did the first seminar in Blue Springs on Tuesday. About halfway through, I thought, man, this is a real quiet crowd. It was like, must be. Rough day, it was always in the middle of the afternoon right after lunch, you know, that's a terrible time to have a meeting to keep everybody awake, especially if they had a time for lunch, right? So I thought, well, maybe it's not the best topic. But gauging by all the comments that we got afterwards and the comments from folks both in, on, the, on, on the surveys that we provide, I realized that I think there was a lot of stuff that they were thinking about. Because I think we brought up some, some points and some things that every dealership in here needs to be concerned with. Okay? We're also going to kind of finish up today with uh, OSHA, a little OSHA perspective. What does OSHA expect from lifts? What if they come around? I'm not going to beat it to death because I think safety is more important than OSHA, but I think there is a possibility on the horizon somewhere down the road that you could see an OSHA inspection. And if you do, and if it is because of automotive lifts, how would they cite you? What would they look for? What kind of documentation should you have? Okay, let's talk about different types of automotive lifts and use. There's several different types of use in dealerships, two posts, four posts, parallelogram, scissor, mid-rise, pole column, and the old in-ground lifts. Runway lifts, such as four posts, are very common. The first two are what we see as the most common used lifts in our dealerships. That sound right? Probably see more of those. I don't know if I see a lot of in-grounds. There are some dealerships building new that are going back to thin grounds. Did you guys, Jim, go with thin grounds? Yeah. So a lot of the technology in lifts has improved quite a bit. I think it's safe to say that Jim's in-ground lifts are a whole lot different than the big old round single cylinders that leaked all the time and the rush rate, the rings rust off and they pop cars out of the ground, all that kind of stuff, right? Parallelograms, mid-rise, low-rise, column lifts. Anybody in here work on big trucks? We've got a few dealerships that's got heavy duty trucks and they'll use a, co a column or a wheel lift like that. And then the in-ground lifts is probably more common like what, uh, what Jim has over there on the two post cassette lift. Okay, two different types, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical means that the posts are opposed, directly opposed to each other. On an asymmetrical, the lifts are offset. Why would those, what's, what's the difference between those two lifts? Anybody in here have both types? You know, the symmetrical load, the vehicle has to be far, a little farther forward. On an asymmetrical, the idea is to be able to shift it backwards so that you can access the doors, open the doors easier on it, on an asymmetrical post. Okay. On a symmetrical lift, arms are, front rear arms are usually the same length. CG is placed between the two posts. Vehicle doors are harder to open to access the interior. On the, center, on the uh, asymmetrical front and arm lengths are not always the same length. And then the center of gravity could be backwards a little bit on that lift. What we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about lift inspections, daily safety checks that the technicians need to do. How many folks in here have your technicians check out the lifts every day? 
when they work on them. Okay? How many folks in here do your technicians raise the lift up and let it back down on the safety locks, or do they just raise it up where they want to be and go up underneath it? How many of you guys in here seem like you're always having a lift that has to be worked on or maintained? Or something leaking or something blown or a cylinder out of it or a seal leaking or something of that nature. I'm going to tell you, I think one of the biggest reasons is because of the way most of the technicians race cars. Most of them raise it up where they want to, they go up underneath it. A lift, none of the lift manufacturers would tell you that their lift is designed to support the weight of that vehicle on the cables, the cylinder, or the chains. They're supposed to be, they're supposed to be lowered back down onto the uh, latches and make sure that both latches are engaged. Anybody ever had a lift burp where it drops two or three inches? You know what I mean? Maybe it's just an air bubble inside a cylinder. It really happened on the old big grounds, didn't it? You know, you raise an old big ground when they got low on fluid, and sometimes they drop a foot or 18 inches. You guys remember back in those days? So uh, it eliminates that. It eliminates the chance that that thing could drop. If we've got the weight on the locks and the technician's working on a component, he's got his arm way up inside the lift like this and his head's right here by a cross member. If that lift were to drop two inches, he could crack him on the head, could break a neck, or should could be some other issues. And the other thing too is it saves a lot of the preventive maintenance on lifts to have them rest them on the locks like that instead. So something just that simple. We're going to talk about restricting operation to train employees. Employee training. Lifting and loading vehicles safely, some of the things we're going to talk about there. Management checks that need to be done once a month. A little bit of OSHA, and then some information on the Automotive Lift Institute. Does that sound like fun? Yeah. Okay. Any folks in here that have known me for more than about five minutes know that I like to talk. All safety people do. So I know you guys are busy. I promise to keep it short and do everything I can to get you out here by 11 o'clock. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say that. You really do. You're also very It's like I know this guy. He ain't really do. So now we're gonna we're gonna do this quick. We'll take a break about 9:15, and then we'll be done total no more than 10:30. Okay. So or 10 o'clock. I'm sorry. We'll be right at our hand. Okay. Let's talk about lift inspections. Again, by a show of hands, how many of you guys have your lift inspected once a year? Anybody from Kevin? I know you are kind of from the St. Louis area. Anybody else from close to St. Louis? Does Boone County have a lift inspector? Does the county require lift inspections? No. No. St. Louis County does. Okay. We're going to talk about those are okay to comply with county regulations. We're going to talk about inspections a little more in depth, like having a lift manufacturer do it. Okay. Somebody come out and do a bill of sale, a bill of health on a lift, and why they need to be done. Okay. They do. They should be done at least once a year. You ought to have them done by a qualified lift inspector. Now, what does that mean? No, probably not Bob's hydraulic shop. Unless you know for a fact that Bob sells these lifts and Bob's confident and you got comfort in, in Bob checking out your lifts. Okay. Um, they need to be, we talked about county, uh, a couple of inspectors down in the St. Louis area. Uh, I put this in here, just be careful with county inspectors because we had a couple of years ago of inspectors in St. Louis. Uh, most of the most of the dealerships assumed that because the county was inspecting them, that was as good an inspection as that they needed. And they also told me that one guy would come in, takes about an hour to go through all the lifts, and the other guy came in, took five minutes, and as long as you paid him 15 bucks a lift, he was happy to give you a sticker. Probably not exactly what you're looking for. Do you have his name? Uh, no. no. I'm, I'm sure he's charging 20 bucks now. 20 bucks a lift now. Okay. Because what you really are looking for, folks, when your lifts get inspected, is you're looking for a certificate of health on each one of your lifts. This is documentation proving that you did the inspection should you have an OSHA visit, proves that you did the inspection should you have a claim under workers' count or a lawsuit because you dropped a car or something of that nature. It proves that you were a, a, a diligent employer that took care of the lifts to the best, the, the best of your ability. There's also another concept called risk transfer. Risk transfer is not the primary reason for why we want you to do lift inspections, but it's an ancillary benefit that you get for free. It's basically, it's kind of like an insurance policy for free. Anybody ever heard the term risk transfer before? Has anybody in here ever in your life bought an insurance policy? Got insurance on your car, your house, anything like that. Guess what you've done? You have transferred your risk of a house burning to the ground to an insurance company for exchange for the premium. That's what risk transfer is. 
what happens is we had a vehicle years ago that fell off a four post lift because one of the safety latches was missing a spring and when the chain snapped on the lift, the spring didn't engage the safety and it dropped the front left corner of the Chevy truck on the ground, hit the technician in the head, knocked him down, slid against the lift in the bay next to him, right against the operator controls. Nobody was there, technician spent about a night in the hospital getting a CAT scan and everything checked out. He was okay, fortunately could have been worse. The tech on the other side, as soon as the lift came down, reached over, grabbed him by the collar and drug him out from underneath the truck. What if somebody had been standing beside the lift beside him? operate on that. So in a lot of ways it got like the lift had just been inspected three months ago and the lift the guy that did the lift inspections missed the fact that it had a spring. Okay? In that case what happens is if you have a scenario like that we will subrogate against the company that did the insurance and your workers comp claim or a large portion of your workers comp claim may be reimbursed by the company the insurance company from the company that did the inspections. Okay? That's what risk transfer means. Now, that's not the reason that we do it, okay? We want you to do inspections so that the inspector will find the spring that's missing, okay? Find the leaf spring that was rusted or the cable that was frayed or whatever, that's, that's the whole point. But just kind of keep in mind that there is something, if you've got the paperwork documentation proof that it's got inspected, it may be a will segregate against their insurance company if you have an, an injured employee. Okay. Daily lift checks. Can you guys ask your technicians or require your technicians to check their lifts before they use them? Anybody in here? What kind of things do you think they'll look for? Or should they be checking? If you were using a lift, what would you want to know about your lift before you walked up underneath the car that weighed more than you could uh, lift? If uh, the locks are engaging properly. Travis says if the safety locks are engaging, does that sound good to everybody? Yeah, make sure the arm locks aren't rusted, make sure maybe it's not leaking or anything like that. Some of the things, here's a list of some things that everybody should have a handout in your handout materials too, the slides, the exact slide presentation that we've got. Uh, look for leaks that indicate leaking cylinders. You ever seen that in your shop? One of your lifts. You'd be, well maybe you wouldn't be surprised. How many times Joe and I walk in a dealership to see that, the guys are still using a lift. Okay. Uh, maybe it's a small leak, maybe whatever. A large, large portion again like this could be caused by how they're actually lifting the vehicle. Broken or missing components. Would these qualify as broken or missing components? I took that picture like two weeks ago. I kind of laughed with them. I said, man, nice try. That's a nice safety last cover. I'm sure Mobile One appreciates the, the promotion, you know, whatever. So. Here's a safety, here's a safety last missile lift. This is kind of hard to see with the lights. Joe, would you turn the lights down just a little bit, please? Each one of those dimmers, I think, does it. Can you turn the lights down a little bit? You can maybe see the pictures a little better. Oh, that's probably as good as it's going to go. Okay. The rubber pads on top of the arm on the adapters. Uh, some lifts have rubber pads, some lifts from rotary are designed with just metal adapters. But if your lift is designed with rubber pad, it ought to have a rubber pad on it. If not, they become slippery to not design an old that car. I've had several service managers tell me uh, recently too that some manufacturers are putting a coating on the frames of cars. It's real waxy. I know what that, you know what that is. It's like a undercoat, I guess. Has anybody had any of those? We've had cars slide and slip off an, an adapter and land on the running board and damage a running board or damage a rocker panel just because the, the frames are greasy and hard to hang on to. So you need to make sure that the rubber pads are there. Frayed cables, rusted or frozen chain links. Anything that looks like that. All of that. Those things, this is, granted this is a much older design here. Okay. Um, one thing that we find too lately is the two post above ground frame engaging lift is one of the most common styles that dealerships are using nowadays. Joe, would you turn the lights back up just a little bit please. I think it's daylight coming through the windows, washing this out. So, one of the most common ones there. Does anybody know what your uh, deductible on liability is? The dealership's deductible? Anybody know? I have heard on liability policies anywhere from $1,000 to $5,000 on a deductible. Um, I've got dealers, I've got service managers that are being able to buy rotary lifts installed for about $3,600. 
that sound about the right prices that you guys have seen? Does that sound right or off? 30, 36, 37, 4 thousand dollars. A lot of times you could completely replace a lift that's leaking or damaged or whatever for cheaper than what the deductible would cost you if you dropped a customer's car and had to repair it. So, just a few things to think about. Broken rusted missile lines, safety latches or locks. Ever had safety latches on a lift that look like those? Folks, these are some things on lifts that are really, really, really easy to overlook. And honestly, I think it's because the technicians are using these things every day, six days a week, and they get comfortable with them, and there's a few things they just don't catch. The problem is, I think having an intentional inspection once a day it only takes them five minutes to say, hey guys, before you use this lift, I want you to run it up, check the arm locks, make sure they work, make sure you hear two clicks on the safety latch, check for leaks, check the cables, chains, you're done. That's pretty much the basics of what they need to look for. Okay? This one up here is uh, safety latches turned sideways. It's kind of hard to see. Here's a bigger picture of a different style. You see this one here? See the teeth on the gear? See how it's just completely backwards? The lift manufacturer, they only put this lift in about two months before I took that picture. And the manufacturer, put it, whoever installed it, put it together backwards. Like uh, that arm lock wouldn't, wouldn't lock. Okay. This one, this style, that's what happens if they leave a tire or uh, part on the ground, let the car all the way down, bends up, and then safety latch house covers missing covers. Years ago, I used to not care about safety latch houses not having covers on and in one year, we had two finger amputations in, in the same year on safety latch houses. One guy lit the car down, and when he palmed the lever to push it down, his finger went through a hole on the side of the lift. He didn't realize it and nipped off the tip of his finger. And another one was, what's a politically correct way of saying no? This guy had a handle lid broken off, and he was using his finger to release the safety valve. And he didn't pull it out far enough and the cradle came down, caught the part of the safety and flipped it back up against the lift and pinched his finger off. Okay, so from that point on, I'm like, okay, every lift out there, if the manufacturer put a cover on it, which is really the way it should be, should be a cover. The only thing I'd recommend is uh, leave a mobile container in the trash can. <laughs> the mobile one container in the trash can. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a few more examples. Anybody ever have a technician put a bungee cord on a lift? or vice grips. I've got a really good story we're going to end up on this one to kind of illustrate the point. And then here's one where the safety latch was just twisted sideways. Why would employees disengage the safety latch? It's easier to let it down with one hand. Easier to let it down with one hand, Kevin says. June says lazy. Okay. Uh, sometimes the lifts come down slow on purpose. That's an industry standard. It's kind of what I, one of the terms that safety nerds use. It's an industry standard. That's how they're designed. They're designed to prevent entrapment. So if you hit or your car, you back up, and you don't realize you get bumped by a car, you can get out of the way. Okay. Sometimes they don't want to sit there and hold the pull the levers down. They're designed with two levers, one for the safety latch release, and it's a, it's a momentary contact type of a button if it's an air release. When you let go, with the locks release or engage. When you let go of the release lever, it stops coming down. So sometimes technicians want to go to the parts counter, go get something, or go grab a smoke while they're waiting on a car to come down. <clears throat> Could you imagine if somebody's kid runs through the back door and the technician's at the parts room not standing there by the lift? Could that cause any liability? What if they leave an oil dolly and forget, they forget to clear it and then leave an oil dolly under the car, then they wire it down and they walk away? Think an oil dolly's heavy enough to knock the car off lift? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, they can. They're not that they're not that thick, but it didn't take much to push a car off a lift. Check the rubber pad adapters. We talked about that. Restricting operators that are not approved or trained. How many folks in here actually have a policy that does not specifically disallows employees that haven't received training on lifts from operating lift? How many of you folks in here ever have a struggle keeping salesmen out of the shop? Don't raise your hand. I don't think I'd get in trouble on that one. Okay? Not that salesmen are evil, but when I walk through the shop and I see a salesman and a customer on a car on a lift looking up, it makes the hair on the back of my neck go up. We have had customers come back in at lunch 
Go to the sales department and say, hey, I need to get my purse, my wallet, my whatever, my book, my iPad, my iPod, my iPhone, my whatever out of the car. Salesman says, oh, no problem, I'll go help you. And then see a salesman out there trying to let a car down, or worse, putting a ladder up against the lift to climb up on the lift and crawl in the car to go get it. Okay? So you really ought to have, would recommend having a process, procedure, policy, however you apply that, that salesmen are forbidden from ever going into the service department to use a lift. Or anybody that isn't trained on that. Okay? Sales office, don't let customers under leave underneath unless it's absolutely necessary. Here's, here's a picture of what I was talking about. Always makes my skin itch just a little bit from a liability standpoint. You know, hurting a customer, hurting an employee is one thing because their benefits are set by state law and workers' comp, and that's what workers' comp is for. Hurting the customer, the benefits are set by the jury. You guys understand what I'm saying? Okay, so this depends on the lawyer. And, you know, so did they retain the law firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe, and you get a notice of a lawsuit because the car fell and somebody got hurt, or the car fell and just got damaged and they wanted to sue you because they found a lawyer that would do it. Okay. <clears throat> Let's talk about lift operating trainings. I'm going to spend a little more time on this for about the next 15 minutes. So we'll take a quick break. Uh, training, you really should have a good detailed training process. Uh, I have some materials for you as promised. Um, there is a PowerPoint presentation that you can take back and use. It's basically this presentation, and you're going to see a lot of points pop up two or three times as we go through this this morning. The reason is, is I designed it to boil it back down so that you could take home the lift presentation for the employees also. Okay. It's on our website. I'll have the, I'll put the link up at the break. Uh, you go to MEDA.com, go under safety or the workers' comp page, and there's a link that says automotive lift safety presentation documents. Okay. Uh, I've also put together a checklist. You should have a copy of that in your handouts. A training checklist for technicians. When you hire a tech, you put him into work. It's just a, a way to document everything that you told him and the training topics that you've covered. And then they sign it, you sign it, you put it in the file, and the data was there. So if you'd ever, a question ever comes up through an injury, through a compliance audit, anything of that nature, you can say, yes, we provided training, here's the documentation, here's a checklist that denotes what we talked about today, I hired an employee. There's also a fun 25 question test that we put together that you can use with the employees. Let's talk about what they should uh, be trained on. Really needs to be done at time of hire before job assignment. You ought to have some mechanism for recurrent training every couple of years, have a safety meeting with everybody, go over the stuff just again, maybe once a year at a shop meeting. Say, hey guys, let's just touch base on these lifts again. I want you guys to understand, remember, and be aware of what could happen to you if a lift falls off, or a car falls off a lift. Okay? I really do think also it is one of the most overlooked areas of safety in the dealership. Don't assume that these guys know how to use a lift just because they came from a shop and they used a different lift. You have no idea if the shop they came from had a safety program, if safety was important, or the manager said, screw it, it's not important, it's a waste of my time. Okay? So we want to make sure that they receive the orientation and training when they come in. We need to talk about lift controls, operations of lift safeties and locking devices, manufacturers, warnings, and placards, properly spotting, loading a vehicle and lift, stabilizing larger heavy vehicles, Use of adapters. Anybody here got a technician who uses, likes to use wood blocks on a lift? That's pretty common because you might have some guys are picking up trucks with running boards that hang down and the adapters on the lift aren't high enough, so we see a lot of 4x4 four four blocks, 2x2 two two blocks, etc. I would suggest remove the wood and buy some of those rubber blocks that come from a lot of the lift manufacturers are providing. If you got to stack something, use that rubber instead of wood. It's not going to be, it's not going to be a slippery. Lift operation, controls, how do they work? How do they go up? How do they go down? Safety latches, are they working? How to recognize if they're working or not? Any of you guys ever walk through the shop and listen to, you hear a lift working? You ever listen for the clicks? <coughs> Excellent. That's a great way to determine whether or not those safety latches are working. I walk through shops and I'll hear a technician raising a lift and I hear click, click, click. After about the third click, I go walk over and say, how come I don't hear two clicks? Because I see two posts. 
And we have caught safety latches that weren't engaging before because you couldn't hear that click. Tell the technicians about that. Tell them to teach, to teach your technicians to listen for those clicks. On a four post lift, they raise a the car up this high, let her down about three inches, and they should watch each one of the posts on the runners. Does that lift go thunk, 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 or does that lift go thunk, 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 woo, and bend down like this, okay? If it goes down and you see it spraying on the cable a little bit, it's good indication of safety. You got a safety latch problem, right? Okay. Manufacturers' warnings and placards. You need to go through that. Your technicians need to be aware of the warnings that the manufacturer issues. Anybody ever seen the logo, the stick figure, the car's teetering on the lift and he's running this way? Okay. Which direction are they supposed to run? I have had technicians in the past tell me, yeah, one time years ago I had a car fall off the lift. I said, what'd you do? He said, I ran over, jumped up, hung under the bumper wall. One of the other guys could let it down real quick. <laughs> a small car weighs 4,000 pounds. Okay? Now, I've known Justin for a couple of years. I hope Justin doesn't mind me picking on it. If you guys notice Justin back here, he's about a foot taller than the rest of us. <laughs> Justin is a big, strapping, strong guy. Okay? I think that's safe to say. All right? I bet Justin can't bench press 4,000 pounds. And that's a small vehicle. Okay? So they need to get away from it. But guys, it's human nature to catch stuff that falls. We have $50,000 back injuries from employees trying to catch a $1,500 transmission that wasn't strapped down to the check right. But it's human nature to catch it because it's starting to fall. Right? So they need to know that. They also need to know that they shouldn't run towards a wall or a corner. If the car is teetering this way and his first reaction is to get away and the wall's right here, all of a sudden, uh-oh, now what do I do when the car comes down between me and the wall? Right? So the stuff that they need, they need to know, they need to talk about. Privately spotting and loading a vehicle on the left. Um, you guys remember the... I'm getting ahead of myself here. Let me jump forward a little bit. Back in the old days, most lifts, I think even some new lifts now, are still coming with spotting dishes, right? And is anybody in here? Jim, do your lifts have those little spotting dishes? Yes. And you're probably as new as anybody in here. Okay. What's the problem with spotting dishes? I have found that a lot of times they become bullseyes, not reference marks. I've seen Dooley diesel four-door, four-wheel drive pickups spotted on the lift with the front tire right on top of that spotting dish. Where should they be? Yeah, the manufacturer, let me tell you what, sorry. The manufacturer would tell you it needs to be about a foot farther forward than that, right? What about short cars? Sometimes shorter vehicles need to be stopped before that. So they need to know how to properly spot a vehicle. <clears throat> On functions of safety latches, we talked about listening for the clicks, making sure they work. They're not going to, obviously not going to work if they're not there. You need to check the crush bar on the lift for operation if it's properly. Yeah, I jumped back on you guys for your slide. Sorry about that. I got hit. I got excited. I got hit myself. It's such a stimulating topic. <laughs> so, most of your lifts nowadays, most of the newer lifts nowadays have crush bars. You need to check those once in a while. Make sure they're working. Make sure the technician doesn't unhook it, has a problem with it, the cable spray, something like that where it doesn't work, and they raise the, they raise the van and it doesn't stop the lift and it crashes on the roof of the van. Don't raise your hand. Does that ever happen to anybody in here? Ever had damage from a truck that got raised up too high? I see some smiles, but no, don't raise your hand. Okay. Here's some examples of safety latches that you need to talk about. Never, ever, ever tie open, remove, or disengage the lift, or lifts, locks, or safety latches. Jen said people get, get lazy. Kevin said they get in a hurry. I forget, I forget exactly what Kevin said. Remember this style of lift right here with the red knobs? If you excuse my French, that is a pain in the ass design, isn't it? Because every time to move that arm, the guy's got to bend over, pull that red knob, and slide it out of the way. Whether it's on the ground or whether it's up here. It was a horrible design. Fortunately, we don't see those on new lifts nowadays that have actually changed on a different design. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why the guys unbolt them. Take them off, disengage them, disconnect them, right? so they don't have to mess with them. This one over here, I think that proves Jen's point right there, laziness. You guys see the wire underneath the airlock release on that one? And then vice grips on this one. This was a mechanical problem. The technician fixed it. Didn't tell anybody. Would you agree that obviously somebody in the shop didn't care? 
that that had a safety, had a, had a pair of flash grips on it. Okay. Here's another one, the same dealership with the other wire. You guys see the wire on this one? When I took the wire loose and flipped it off, I found a notch that the technician had filed in the handle so that the wire would hold. They had thought it through. They really didn't want those things. They want to be able to disengage them and walk, and walk away. Okay. Again, twist it off, and then this is just a good old wire tie stuck over the lever on that one. So, okay. Check for rust or stuck safeties. You really need to train on that also. Technicians need to check every day to make sure these things are rusted. Uh, in the summertime, it seems like you always have a six week period of time where it's real hot and real humid. Get water on the floor, water doesn't evaporate because of all the humidity, and that lift goes down and sets in that water just for weeks at a time until it finally gets cleaned up or something because of humidity. Uh, what happens is these drop pins will rest right here at the cradle. Can you see around me? Sorry, if I turn sideways, is that better? <laughs> <laughs> so you'll see these pins drop down once in a while. They won't drop down because they're rusted right here on the bottom part of that cradle. Okay. Now, once the rust has already eaten through this black oxide coating on that pin, they're going to rust from that point on. Now, all you have to do is technician, or all you got to do is take a can of Rust penetrant, squirt it, hose it down, give it about 10 minutes, and tap it with a hammer. Okay? Have you ever said something to somebody and then as it's coming out you go, oh, I need to add something or maybe I should have said that. I had a technician one time, I said, hey, squirt that stuff down, give it about 10 minutes and whack it with a hammer. And I went, I couldn't, I couldn't stop whack it. And I said, but after the car is off the lift. Okay? Don't beat on the car, you know, with the car on the lift, don't beat on the hammer. So. But usually in about 10 minutes you can loosen up. This is something the techs need to check. What is the purpose of these locks? Can somebody tell me? Keep their arms from moving. Keep their arms from moving. Would you believe that the lift manufacturers, probably because of liability, do not call those safety devices? Those are not safeties. They're very clear about that. You know why? Because, I think it's because of the liability reason. But nine times out of ten, it's been my experience when a car falls off a lift, it's because an arm slides or an arm moves. You ever walk through the shop and see the one car on the lift and you see daylight under one of the four pads? I've seen that. His lifts are never perfectly adjusted. Vehicles aren't flat. Maybe he reached the flat part of the frame over here, but not the flat part of the frame over here. He's got a little daylight, then he grabs a screwdriver to go prying on something. Gets her bouncing. Placards. We talked about that. Review the placards of the employees. If they're inspected, make sure there's a sticker on them. Draw special focus to lift capacity. Never should the lift's capacity be exceeded. Let me ask you a question. You have a 14,000 pound ambulance in your shop that you're going to work on and you're using the 15,000 pound lift. Is that lift enough lift for that ambulance? Does that 14,000 pound ambulance exceed the capacity of that lift? Depends on what's in it. Depends on what's in it. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, you need to be aware of the load, right? right. What's in the vehicle. Uh, say the ambulance comes in with a 9,000 pound rear axle weight and a 5,000 pound front axle weight. When you pick it up, we take the 15,000 pound capacity from the van or from the, from the lift, you have to divide that by four, that's 15,000 pounds equally distributed amongst the four arms. Okay? So it's about 3,750 pounds, if my math is right, if I remember my high school algebra. Right? 3,750. Rear axle weight is 9,000 pounds. We lift that ambulance, how much weight are we putting on the rear arms? 4,500 pounds. Guys, let me be trans... Sorry, that sounds like a political comment if I say transparent. <laughs> I'm laughing at everywhere. Let me be transparent and clear. When, we, when I put the presentation together and was doing the research on this, I didn't think about that. I didn't know that. But here's a statement from the Mohawk, Mohawk Lift uh, president or one of the guys training that he actually works out the math. 15,000 pound lift, 14,000 pound ambulance, 4,000 pounds on the front, 9,200 on the back, 4,600 pounds on the back arms that are rated for 3,750 pounds. Could cause lift failure. Usually what else happens when technicians are raising big, heavy, or long vehicles? What do they do with the arms? Do they keep them nice and short, or do they extend them all the way out so they can hit the frame or the spring carrier or whatever? So that tends, once you get an arm stretched out like that, it's going to reduce the capacity on that lift too. So. I never thought about that, folks, I'll be honest with you. Okay. So, according to the Mohawk guy, a 14,000 pound ambulance should be lifted by no, no less than an 18,400 pound lift. So, 
know some things to think about. Uh, somebody asked me Tuesday, said, if you were building a lift, how would you build it? I said, I'd build a lift, I'd break it. If it broke at 20,000 pounds, I would name it a 10,000 pound lift, and I'd put a motor on there that would only pick up 10,000 pounds. So most of your lifts are probably do have a safety factor, but you don't want to rely on it. You want to make sure you've got enough lift capacity there. When loaded vehicles properly spotting, uh, just like Kevin said, you need to be careful of, I'm sorry, it wasn't Kevin, it was uh, Ryan. Yeah, sorry about that, Ryan said it. Like Ryan said, you need to be aware of the load of the vehicle. Uh, probably 20 years ago, I walked in a Ford store in Kansas City, they had an old 1985, 82 Ford four-wheel drive pickup. I was, when I saw it right across the shop, I could see that the rear bumper was about 18 inches lower than the front bumper. And I could see the bed full of junk on the truck. I walked over to the tech and I said, hey, if you don't mind my asking, what are you getting ready to do? And he said, well, the four-wheel drive won't hook up. I'm getting ready to drop the front axle. I said, come over here a second. Let me show you what I'm looking at. I said, I walked in back about 20 feet and I went, anything look bad to you in this design? Oh, yeah completely oblivious to the fact that he had a whole bed full of junk. I was in a Toyota store about three or four months ago, walking out in Loop Bay. They had a Chevy pickup on a Loop Bay that they were doing oil change, tire rotation from a glass company, mobile glass company. Has they ever seen those trucks driving down the road, got the big metal frames in the bed of this truck that were designed to haul plate glass windows? I thought for the first time in all my years, I was actually going to be there when a vehicle fell off the lift. Because when I walked out of service into the loop bay, I watched that truck do this three times. And fortunately, the third time it dampened and it went back down. And I walked around the front of the truck. There was a kid up there that had just pulled the tire off the right front side. And I said, you got a jack stand? He goes, what? I said, a jack stand, stabilizing jack, one of the big ones, like six foot. I don't know, nobody's ever talked to me about those. One of the techs heard me, he took him, they disappeared, and about five minutes later he found the jack stand, brought it back, and we helped him put it up underneath the receiver hitch and stabilize that, stabilize that vehicle. Was completely oblivious to the fact that there's 1,500 pounds of metal on the back of this truck that changed the balance point on the truck. Okay. Anybody know what, when I'm talking about center gravity, you guys know what I mean? If I was big enough to pick, a, pick this truck up and balance it on my finger like the, global, the Harlem Globetrotters and spin it around, where would that vehicle balance? So when I load it on the lift, where should that balance point be? It needs to be between the arms, pretty much as close to a line straight between those the lift posts as it possibly can. And accessories, components, and loads on a vehicle can change the way that vehicle balances and what the balance point is. And I think that is probably one of the key things that causes cars to fall off the lift is a center of gravity shift. Do you agree with that? Anybody ever seen it? Why don't we take a five minute break? It's nine. Wow, I'm proud of myself. I'm actually on time. Nine fifteen. Okay. So take a little break. All right, folks. Let's go ahead and get started again. continue talking about spotting a vehicle by using the lift manufacturer's lifting points. Uh, we do see a lot of this also to where sometimes because of the lift limitations, the size of the arm, where they spotted it, they couldn't reach the right manufacturer's lifting points. How do you know how to identify where the manufacturer's lift points are? Can anybody tell me? Any materials or information on how to do that? Most of the vehicles service nowadays, manual. service manuals, like I said, Jim, yep, service manual, manual will tell you, other information, website from the manufacturer, you can probably Google it. Uh, Automotive Lift Institute, and this is not an ALI commercial, but uh, ALI is kind of like the main player in lift safety. ALI is a national trade association, similar to MADA being a state trade association. Uh, our members are auto dealers, their members are lift manufacturers. They promulgate safety materials, uh, an American National Standards Institute standard on lifts on how they're to be designed, and they also have a certification process for manufacturers of automotive lifts in the United States. 
So we're starting to see a lot of companies bringing in um, <coughs> lists from China and Korea that may not necessarily have that certification. They're going to be a little bit cheaper, but they're probably not as well met or built because they don't meet the certification. ALI, among some of the materials that they provide, they do provide a manufacturer's lift points guide on all vehicles produced since, I think, like 2007. So now, any lift that you buy from a member company of ALI is going to have a safety video that comes with it, the ALI materials, and that lift guide automatically provided for you. Okay. <clears throat> Beyond that, most vehicle manufacturers will stamp an emblem, like a triangle or some type of, of emblem, on the bottom of a unibody car, like that. Or you can find them on the uh, stickers on the doors, too. A lot of times they'll tell you where the, uh, where the manufacturer's lift points are. Very important that they use the lift points. Wood blocks we've talked about, there's a picture of that. Uh, much better to use a rubber block than a wood block, wood block slide, especially with some of the waxy coatings that some of the manufacturers are putting on under coating now, uh, whatever the processes are using for under coating. Okay. Unibody cars, full frame cars, back in the good old days we had full frame vehicles, lifting points were pretty easy, pretty much at the frame, right? A lot of guys on pickups, I'll see them using a spring hanger. The manufacturer says that a spring hanger is okay, but not to rest it on the spring. The spring isn't flat, the spring's not a solid surface. I see a lot of guys that'll reach up on the front side of a pickup and lift it up by the spring instead. The problem with lifting it from a spring is any movement of that vehicle on the lift, any rocking at all while they're working on it, can cause that vehicle to walk right off the adapter that was put on the spring, because the spring's moved. So they can use a spring adapter, but they can't use a spring. Door stickers. Mark with a symbol. Tell them that the technicians make their own. Figure, tell them to figure out on the cars they work with where the manufacturer's lift points are. Okay? Probably not a huge deal to most of our dealers. Most of our new car dealers are going to be primarily servicing their own vehicles and every model of your own vehicle, but you won't have to worry about hopefully everybody others' models. And with some exceptions, you will. You'll have used cars and stuff to come in too, I'm sure. But the technicians need to make sure that they are using the proper lift points. Every vehicle is a CG, we talked about that. Safely lifting a vehicle knows where the center of gravity is. Here's a picture of one of the glass trucks like I was talking about. This is a little bit older, the glass truck. But do you think the center of gravity on that truck is towards the front of that vehicle or towards the rear of that vehicle? Towards the rear. Absolutely. Guiding vehicles onto a lift. Let's talk about this. Everybody, everybody who text eventually will help somebody guide a vehicle onto a lift and stand aside to do whatever. We have numerous claims that have happened to us from employees standing directly in front of a vehicle when they got it on the lift. Okay. All they got to do is take one big step like this and they're out to the side where the driver can see them or they can, they're, they're not directly in front of the car when it's, when it's uh, coming on the lift. Here's some recent injuries. Two broken fingers when a vehicle pins employed to a metal table bolted to a center block wall. I got to see the city, uh, security video on this dealership. Two kids were bringing in a van. It was, had been icy outside. The windshield was covered with ice, but they had a spot about this big cleared off. They uh, watching the video three times where he's trying to go over it. It was an ingrown cassette lift, like he has. <coughs> you see him bump it about three or four times. He opens the door, sticks his head out, bumps it again, can't get the car to come up. The kid driving the van stands up, leans outside the truck and puts his foot over here and hits the gas. The kid in front trying to direct him between the arms on the lift. The van launches the next time over top of that, catches him, pins him against a steel table, breaks his legs. Your femurs are these two long bones right here. You know what the hardest bone in the human body to break is? Your femurs. It takes like 6,000 pounds of force to break a femur. Apparently a three-quarter ton van provides that readily. So now, common sense would say stay out of the way, right? If a vehicle, and this is something that is a good training point that we do include in the training presentation. Say, guys, if you're helping somebody in the shop, if you're walking through the shop, if you're working in the shop, don't stand in front of a car that's running. Don't stand behind a car that's running, okay? Second one was that an advisor, the van launched off the front, and it was a van also, it launched off the front of the lift, bent the vehicle stops on a runway lift. You know the metal plates that are designed to stop it? 
bent them over when it launched off the front, caught him, knocked him into a toolbox and a corrugated metal wall. Broke a leg, but fortunately it was a corrugated metal wall, not a center block wall, because the wall bent with the force of his body in the toolbox and pushed the wall back about this far and caught a lot of force. Then the last one was an advisor. They were loading a car that had been modified for hand controls. One advisor wasn't comfortable with it. The other advisor was like, well, I've driven it before. And then the throttle stuck and she was standing right in front and knocked her down, bruised her head, broke her leg, and knocked down the center block wall all the way back. So just something as simple, and there was, there was a fourth one I should have included. We had another tech, I have no idea how this happened, had another tech guy in the car, and he's got his head down looking at the tire to make sure it's coming up on an alignment rack right. His head gets caught between the tire and a metal part of the lift, and he freaked out because he said he heard a pop in his head when the car caught him. Fortunately, it wasn't a fractured skull, and he was, he was okay. But, so they really need to stay out of the way, away, and not in front of vehicles when they're loading onto off lifts. That's something that you definitely need to go through on training. We've talked about that, except for one point, the last point I want to raise, I want to, I want to bring up. We talked about everything else in here. Ensure the alarm locks engaged. This is the actual <coughs> process for lifting the vehicle that you should go through the tank. Spot the vehicle correctly, take a walk around, think about the car, what are the truck, what are you picking up. If it's got a, uh, if it's got a uh, camper shell on the back of it, oh, stick your head inside, look and make sure it doesn't have 2,000 pounds of electrician's tools or something like that in the back. Make sure your capacity is good, know what the capacity of the lift is. Adjust the adapters correctly, lift it, raise it just until the tires come off the ground and grab the bumper and shake the snot out of it. Now in here I said gently rock it, okay? Manufacturer says moderately rock it. I did a safety meeting with a bunch of techs and I made that comment. I said raise it off the ground and shake the snot out of it. One of the techs said, yeah, but it might fall. <laughs> That's the point. We want to know. I want you to do this. Okay. I walked out of a dive store yesterday up in Kansas City as I was leaving after about a three and a half hour loss control visit. I hear bang, 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 bang. I look up, there's two kids doing a brake job on the car. He's got a dead blow hammer. He's about this big, weighed about a buck fifty, and he was hitting that thing as hard as he possibly could to get something to come loose when he's doing a brake job. Probably trying to take a hub off my guess. A little dodge or something, I don't know. You think that kind of a shaking is normal work that they do when they got lifts on it? cars on the lift? Absolutely. Have them pick it up, just clear the tires, shake that thing, and then check the adapters and make sure it's secure before they go up. You want it to fall from six feet off the ground or six inches? Right. So, good technique on that. Recheck the position of the arms, raise the desired height, listen for the clicks, lower the vehicle back onto the safeties. Okay? Don't let the vehicles, don't let the, the cylinders, the seals, the cables, and the chains hold the weight of that vehicle, okay? Lower to the safety, that's what the manufacturers actually put those on there for, is to support the weight of the vehicle on that lift, okay? It's gonna be a lot more stable. Stabilize, we talked about jack stands. Remove, remember to remove the jack stand before you lift the car down. They need to take a walk around and check and make sure all jack stands, tool carts, tool boxes, oil dollies, whatever's not from underneath the vehicle. They should stand there facing the vehicle with both hands on the controls while it goes up or while it goes down. Okay? It probably takes, what, 30 seconds for a car from six feet high to go all the way to the ground? Maybe not even that much. But they feel like it takes forever just because you feel like you're having to stand there and hold it down because of the way it's designed like that. Sometimes stabilizing a lift load may require tying or strapping a vehicle components to the lift. I still am not used to this. I'm not used to walking into a Ford store, seeing the chassis and the bed sitting on the ground in the cab six feet in the air. Still got to get used to that. But if I walked out there with Ralph and lifted a hood, where's the engine on most of these Ford trucks sitting nowadays? It seems like it's all the way back up under the firewall. I, I understand that's a common part of the repair, but I'm not used to seeing it. But a lot of times when they lift them up like that, they need to put a strap around the backside, strap them to the <coughs> arms, right? Because the cab could be nose heavy. So that may be part of stabilizing a vehicle. Ever have a technician do that? Especially if they work on pickups? Here, I'll step out of the way. Ever have a technician just use the front two arms because they just want to raise the front wheels off the ground, not the back wheels? Okay. That is an unbalanced <coughs> load on that lift. How much force do you think is putting on the mounting bolts on the back side of that post? Quite a bit. 
and can actually cause that lift to fail. Let's put the force here, let's put the force on that, on the column too. If they're going to lift a vehicle, make sure they put all four pads underneath that, lift them all four at the same time. Okay. And it's it's quite common, guys. I see that quite a bit. But they, I think what it is is the tanks just don't realize when they lift it like that, that lift isn't designed to carry the load like that. Okay. Six foot stabilizing jacks, we talked about that. Process, you need to cover the process with your employees on how to stabilize the vehicle. Raise the vehicle up, set it back down on the locks, then take the safety latches to the vehicle and adjust the stabilizer. Oh, I said safety latches, I'm sorry. Take the stabilizer jack stand to the vehicle and then adjust it to the vehicle. Not only larger heavy vehicles need to be stabilized, sometimes a short vehicle may need to be stabilized too. We had a dealership dropped a, who makes the ZX2? Remember the old ZX2? Was that Mercury? Ford? Okay. He was doing a tire rotation, didn't set the lift right. He, take a, he took the front wheels off, the rear wheels off, put the rear wheels on the front, and the car went right off the lift. It was very fortunate. It tweaked the shoulder on the way down, but that car dozed off, and you see it laying over here. Working under suspended load. Encourage them not to walk under the vehicle unless it's absolutely necessary. Okay. Would you say it's inherently risky to have your technicians under a chunk of metal that weighs more than they can lift? There is an inherent risk of something bad happening, right? It's called stored energy. We safety nerds call it kinetic energy. Okay? That, because we know what goes up can go down. And maybe not where when we plan. Right? So it's inherently risky. If he walks out of his shop to go to the park or his bay to go get parts, maybe he suggests don't walk underneath the next five cars. Okay? Service advisors out in the shop, if I need to go out and check a vehicle, don't walk underneath the car. Stand out beside the car and talk to the technician. That's, a, that's again, it's that concept of don't put yourself in a line of fire. When you guys stop at a gas station and you get out to get gas, does anybody, and a car pulls up behind you, does anybody in here wait until that car goes into the park or shuts off <coughs> before you walk between the cars? That's just something I picked up on years ago. I do. I came out of a, a convenience store one time. I bought a soda. I'm walking out. There's a little old lady jumped in her car. I hear her starting it up. I stood there like this, and I waited until she picked a direction. You know what I mean? I want to make sure, okay, I hear the car. and starting to move backwards. Now I'll walk down the sidewalk in between. So a simple concept of that. A lot of workers' comp claims that we get are guys are struck against. Hit by objects, caught, caught between. Those are some of the descriptions we use. A lot of it is a technician being in the line of fire. Okay? Working on a, a, a brake length, and they're standing in the plane of rotation with the brake length, or walking underneath the vehicle. Uh, tell them that they really need to discuss excessive rocking or shaking of the vehicle. These two kids yesterday worked standing under the vehicle, but it got my attention when I saw the baseball bat dead ball hammer hitting this car as hard as good. At least neither one of them were under the car while they were beating on it. Be wary of removing heavy components. If you're going to pick up a, a pickup that's got a 300 gallon diesel tank in the back of it, think about it before you do a tire rotation or drop the front axle. Because it will change the center of gravity. Personal protective equipment. You require your employees to wear safety glasses anytime they're working on the car. Most technicians will tell me if I'm grinding on something, beating on something, working on something, yeah, I'll wear safety glasses, but they really need to wear them all the time they're under a car. We don't ask them to wear them all the time in the shop. We've got a few shops that do require that, but as an insurance company, we don't. We think they get common sense. We think they know when they ought to wear safety glasses, and we identify exactly when we expect it, using chemicals, changing oil, draining, whatever. One of the times is any time in your vehicle they need more safety glasses. Cut fingers and eye injuries still account for almost half of all the injuries that we get. Tell the technician you need to think about what could happen before you pry the on a ball joint with a six-foot pry bar. How would you secure a vehicle on a runway lift? Anybody know what these things are right here? Or those things are right there? Vehicle stops is what the manufacturer is like. When that car is on a lift, even though the, the lift has vehicle stops, it still needs to be chalked. Those wheels need to be chalked. What happens if we put a pickup on one of these things and we drop a drive shaft to change a U-joint? Or change the drive shaft? Becomes pretty much a free rolling piece of equipment, doesn't it? At a Chevy store in Kansas City years ago, told me they had a lift six feet in the air. Technician wasn't under, thank God. He'd gone to the parts counter. Truck rolls off a lift six feet in the air, goes bang, bang, rolls out the door, across the parking lot, right between two parked cars. Didn't hit anything, and they swore up and down, didn't hurt the old truck. Really? A six foot fault. Okay, off of that. 
But I've also seen this particular style of lift, the hinge point is here. It's designed that way so that when the lift comes up and the ramps drop down, they create a wheel stop. We had a shop one time that the ramps started digging in the concrete because something wasn't adjusted right, and they got tired of the ramp trying to cock them sideways when they uh, let it down. So they let the lift all the way down, took the vehicle off of it, and took a welder and welded those down so that the ramps wouldn't, they would have to fight the ramps dropping down anymore. Okay. What they do to their wheel stops. Now we catch a lot of times guys not thinking about these. Some lift manufacturers have removable wheel stops on the front. The lift is designed that you can put a ramp on either side. All you can do is grab it and pull it up out of there. So regardless of that, they need to be there. But you also want to make sure those guys are chalking the wheels. Tell them to take the 4x4 four four blocks that they can't use for adapters anymore and use those for wheel chalks instead. Might already have some in the shop. Drive shaft, car coming off the lift like that. Would it look like a good day? Fun day? How do you get a lift? How do you get a car off a lift that falls like that? Very careful. <clears throat> forklift. It's easy to use a forklift. Yeah. You, have, you just have your guy run across, jump up, grab a little front bumper, right? Let it down. Counterweight it. Okay. And a friend of mine, a service manager in Springfield, he said he had this issue. They had a jam nut on top of a four post lift. If you look at some of the four post lifts that have the cables that run through, that come up through, there's a nut and a jam nut on top of it. He said the jam nut came loose. We didn't even know it. Then the other nut came loose and it dropped us a bird. That's just that easy. That's how fast and how easy this stuff happens, folks. He said, I called a, a, uh, he said, I called a record company in Springfield. The guy says, well, I can't get there until this afternoon because my truck's busy hauling an 18 wheeler off the highway. He said, what in the world? Why didn't he set a big record for him? He said, the guy showed up in the biggest tow truck he'd ever seen. He backed it up. There was a half wall between service and the loot bay. He said he backed it up, set his stabilizers, dropped, rose that boom over there, took two cable or two uh, straps around the Suburban, lifted the entire Suburban straight up, swung it sideways, and set it down to the service department to get it off the lift. He said, then I understood why he showed up with an 18-wheeler tow truck with three axles on the back of it to pick up the Suburban off the lift. That was really about the slickest way to get it off there. If a vehicle starts to fall, we've talked about that. Here's that, look, here's that label I was, talk, I was telling you guys about. Uh, there will be some form of that shows a guy going the opposite direction. Tell him, don't try to push, save, grab, whatever. Car starts to rock, you get out from under it. Okay? We can replace the car, we can't replace you. Lower the vehicle processes on that. Remember the speed of the lift lower is purposefully designed to prevent entrapment. All of this, I'm not going to read you guys a slide for a all of these exist because this is also in the presentation for employees. Okay? So as you go through, it gives you some talking points when you go through training. Never take a list for granted. How about don't ever raise a vehicle with somebody in it? That happens once in a while, doesn't it? Once in a while, I'll see a tech going for a ride because they're listening for a noise. I understand that, but as a general practice, they're not really supposed to have anybody in the lift when they're raising it. Okay. Check arm placement, take a moment to check your vehicle. That's really important. Look in the cab, look in the toolboxes. Figure out what's in this truck before they pick it up. They need to just not assume. Okay. There was a picture earlier of a lift. That's a good presentation. I won't go back there. But the, the truck on the lift, the arms were like this. That's a good indication that the front arms on the lift are straight across to hit the frame on the pickup. It's probably tail -headed. Okay, it's probably got an aft center of gravity because they had to lift it too far back. Here's the one I was telling you about our Chevy store that had the, the uh, chain snap and the, uh, I told you they had inspected and the spring was missing. This design, and there's several lifts that use that design, the safety latch is designed to engage if the, ch the cables lose tension, if something breaks. What happened was is it has to have a spring to kick that safety out to engage it, and the front left corner didn't have a spring. You see the operator station on the lift next to it? That's what landed on it. All it did was hit the kid, and the cross member hit the kid head and knocked him down. That could have been a much worse day than that, couldn't it? Could have been a much worse day. That's bad enough. That's bad enough. Okay? Say we didn't have anybody under there, nobody got hurt, thank God. Now we've got to make a phone call to the customer. Anybody here would enjoy that phone call? Make your customer high and get just a little bit really. Anybody ever had a customer that was upset for like a stupid reason? No, it never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it never happens, does it? <laughs> Policies. Do you have a policy on vehicle lifts? 
Do you have a safety policy that the employees have signed that they understand that they are forbidden from tampering with a vehicle lift if there's a, uh, in one of the vehicle lift's controls, if there is a broken, missing, stuck, rusted, leaking component they're required to report it to the supervisor? you have a policy on that one too? Uh, there is a copy at the back side of your handouts. So there's one, it's, a, it's an accountability notice. It's just kind of a, a sample form that we include if you want to use that. There's also a copy of our vehicle lift safety policy. Missouri allows a reduction of workers' comp benefits if somebody's injured failing to follow a, a, a rule or a, a policy established by the company. Any safety policy, any safety rule that you all establish for your companies, it doesn't have to be the insurance companies. It's your safety rules. They can lose 25 to 50% of their benefits, even if they're killed. Might be something you want to let the employees know. I want you to sign this. You're going to have a few employees that say, I'm not going to sign that because you're just trying to take my rights away from me. No, you need to read the policy. Policy says if you have a damaged or malfunctioning lift, that all you have to do is report it to your supervisor. Okay? Once that technician comes up and says, Justin, I got a problem with the lift leak and he's off the hook, we're not going to take a reduction for that. Okay? But he um, also needs to know that they're forbidden from putting bungee cords, wires, staples, whatever, you know, tying down a uh, lift control. So it should, it's good to have that in writing. You should also have a policy that the employees report damaged or broken lifts and supervisor immediately. You ever have some big ugly guy with curly hair from Jet City come up and say, hey, you got a problem with the lift and the technician didn't tell you about it? You ever have an air hose with a hose clamp on it and the technician didn't tell you about it? Okay. You need to make sure there's a clear policy and a clear open door that says if anything happens to these lifts, you report it immediately because you can't fix what you don't know about. Right? And we do, believe it or not, run into that a lot. I think a lot of it, though, is because of the technicians, what they do for a living. They fix stuff. They fix stuff. Thanks for saying that, Ann. So when the air hose blows and the guy needs to get back to work, he doesn't want to wait for a new air hose. What does he do? Buy scripts on it, shuts it off, cuts her off, puts her back together, hose clamp on it, goes press some tape on it, goes back to work. Doesn't tell anybody. Probably doesn't register that they need to tell anybody. Right? So, but we have had those things come apart with little brass fitting tape windows on our cars. 180 pounds of pressure in an air hose, right? A little brass fitting hits you in the head and add insult to injury, the hose paints you to death because you got a 50 foot hose with 180 pounds of pressure, no end on it, so he gets whipped by a rubber hose too, right? So, that's a great workers' comp claim, isn't it? <laughs> so, you need to make sure those guys have a clear policy, any damage, anything needs maintenance, they gotta let you know. Now, I understand completely, we run into it a lot, I have a lot of texts come up to me and go, hey man, look at that. It happened to me last week. Hey, look at this. I got a problem with this. <coughs> Did you tell the service manager? No, it's his responsibility to know this. Really? Really? You didn't tell the guys, but you're, but you're willing to throw him under the bus to the safety guy, which you think is actually here for you, not for the manager. Right? So, safety policy, again, releases the employer once the supervisor has been notified. And here's a copy of what that looks like. What kind of monthly safety checks should the uh, managers do? Uh, not as detailed as a yearly inspection, but you need to go out and check. The technician that you have told you expect to do a daily safety check isn't going to tell you that he put the bungee cord on the lift. Okay? You need to go check it. You need to go check the safeties, especially in the summertime. Check for those drop pins to see if they've rusted out. Okay? If they've rusted, make sure they're working like they're supposed to. Raise the lift up, all you gotta do is just raise a couple inches, reach down there and kick the arm. Does the arm lock or does the arm move? Okay. Check and make sure. When you walk through the shop, you look at the bottom of that carriage like the picture I showed you, look for those tails sticking down. That's what I do. <coughs> That's one of my cheats. I walk through the shop and I look and lift and I don't see a tail. It's like, I'm gonna go find out why. And sure enough, I'll see a safety latch is stuck or rusted. And it's usually a minor deal of a little bit of WD-40 and give a few minutes soak in and then work a loose little hammer. They're a little more in depth. Check and document lift controls work. Document the lift safety devices and locks work as designed if they haven't been removed, tied open, and that they're there. Okay? Check overall lift condition. Look for leaks, broken wells, check arm bushings, etc. Folks, again, I am convinced if you can get your guys to just lower, not, not support the weight of the vehicle on the lift, I think your preventive maintenance and repairs you've got to do will cut in half. Because I think a lot of that 
comes from those guys just resting the weight on the cables and set it down on the safety locks like they're supposed to. When they're working on a car, moving the transmission, they're doing it for a couple hours and that vehicle's bouncing up and down like this, that cylinders, those hydraulic cylinders are not designed to take that bounce and that impact. And I think that's where, I really think that's where the majority of leaks come from. Check the cables, leaf chains, broken lifting components or missing components, look for an afters, check the arms for rubber pads, check the floor bolts, anything normally loose. Once in a while it doesn't hurt, just kind of walk by and say, man, it doesn't look right. Okay. Uh, the lift inspector should check the torque on the floor bolts, mounting bolts, when they come around once a month. Check jam nuts on the four post lifts. Look for any other applicable injuries. A few candid comments. If you guys would indulge me and forgive me for being a little direct. This is just kind of experience from the road, so to speak. Uh, a few things we already talked about. Don't look at the lift needing a minor repairs costing time with downtime for service. Instead, consider how much it's going to cost you if your best diesel tech's gone for two months because the lift burped and cracked him on the head. Remember that your deductible may be cheaper, or your deductible may be more expensive than what it costs you to completely re replace a lift. It's got some leaks and stuff. Right? Prices on lifts have really come down. Require your techs to immediately let you know of any lift that needs repairs. Make sure your managers follow through. The tail of the vice grips. I told you guys I'd get back to that picture, right? I walked through a Ford store years ago, and I saw this. Vice grips, safety latch hanging loose, broken cable. Okay? It's pretty obvious they've had a mechanical problem with this lift. I asked the tech, I said, hey man, I said, what, what's up with your safety <coughs> lifts, or with your, uh, what's up with your vice grips? And he goes, well, he said that cable broke. He said, I told the service manager he's waiting on parts. I said, really? How long have you been waiting on parts? He said, as long as I've been here. I said, how long have you been here? He said, a year. Now, this is an example of what we safety nerds talk about when we say risk taking. Okay? I would be surprised if the manager even knew. Now, I guess everybody's got to ask themselves, how could you not know in a small shop and get an issue like this? I've seen screwdrivers, I've seen box end wrenches stuck underneath these things because the cable stretch and you push one side, the other side is supposed to release and it doesn't release. So the technician grabs a combination of <coughs> wrench, walks around to the other side, pulls it out and goes, thunk, okay, no more problem. Because he doesn't, he, didn't, he, never tells, he never tells the manager. So, make sure that the guys are telling you about problems that need to be fixed, okay? Don't assume the tech knows how to use it. Never take a lift for granted. Remember that what goes up can and will eventually come down. Sometimes when you least expect it to, and how you least expect it to, or at least want it to. Questions or comments so far? Hopefully the candy comments were that bad. <laughs> Too direct. Okay. Just uh, if a lift, somebody asked me Tuesday, you know, if a lift breaks and it's a minor repair. Maybe the inspector comes by and he yellow flags instead of red flags, and what should I do? I said, well, if the manufacturer says that a hydraulic hose at that stage of disrepair needs to be replaced, you probably shouldn't let the guys keep using the lift. Make sure you get repairs. I understand from a production standpoint that's a uh, kind of challenge sometimes, but if the lift is broken, it needs to be taken out of service, it needs to be taken out of service. Okay. There is a, ALI maintains a list of their certified lift inspectors. And I know you guys, in the, in the central Missouri area, I hear like three or four different names, right, for lift companies. Ralph, who do you guys use? Uh, right now we're using ATI. ATI? Okay. Uh, I've heard ATI, I've heard of Corky's. Some of the guys in Jeff City use a guy named Corky's. There's Miller and Meyer in Kansas City. There's several different names. If you guys are ever needing a, a recommendation on a lift inspector, I can get you some names. I can, I can at least give you some names some of the other dealers are using. Okay, in the area if you need somebody. Uh, some of the folks in Kansas City think one particular vendor might be more expensive than another one, so they want to use somebody else. We can get that. Automotive Lift Institute also maintains a database. You can go to their website, put in your zip code number, and they'll give you a list of people they have certified in the area as a lift inspector. Okay? Again, you want to make sure they're certified, you get the sticker from them, get a bill of health from them, get that paperwork and the documentation. Okay, has anybody ever seen an OSHA? No? Good. Yeah? Did you, uh, is the, so is the little sticker true that OSHA is not really a small town in Wisconsin? Mine went really well. 
How many of you guys have you had anybody tell you that OSHA is coming to get you because your vehicle lifts? Nah, have you? No. But there's a few vendors and a few insurance companies. This was tell 20 me. years ago. 20 years ago? Yeah. We keep hearing that. That you guys pass you take one of these and pass them back if you would. This is a, a copy of a local emphasis program we call LETs on auto or on automotive lifts. It is not in our part of the country. Our OSHA offices do not have an inspection focus on lifts right now. But we're also starting to see a few inspections coming down and the OSHA inspectors telling the dealer that they're there because of the losses they had. No, they're not getting them from MADA. Nobody gets our paperwork. It's going to take a law, lawsuit or whatever. However, all of the claims that you have are reported to the Missouri Division of Workers' Comp. I had one last summer. Ocean Inspector showed up and she said, I'm here because you had a finger amputated. She said, I didn't have a finger amputated. I had a finger tip cut off on a jack slit or something like that. They picked it up as an amputation, came out, did an inspection. $5,600 later, with two citations, they left. Okay? So we're starting to see a little bit of that. Could you have a citation or a, an OSHA visit because of automotive lifts? Yeah, you could. There's a possibility that Kansas City or St. Louis might pick up a local emphasis program. But here's what you got to do, folks. If the OSHA person comes in, what are they going to look for and what are they going to want to know? They're going to want to know. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. This is what OSHA did to the cowboy, just in case you guys don't know. It's called the OSHA cowboy. It's been around for 30 years and that's funny. Okay, back up, alarms, lights, turn signals, blinders on the horse. Back up deeper, all that kind of good stuff. I think there's even a fire extinguisher on the backside of the horse. I don't know what that's for. Oh, it's a blue tail fly repellent. Okay. <laughs> Required to get rid of the blue tail fly for horse and stuff. Anyway, why would they show up? You have a formal complaint, you have an amputation, amputations are required to be reported now. You have a fatality, they're required to be reported within eight hours. Multiple hospitalizations are required to be reported okay, to OSHA. Uh, could be a, probably a program inspection they might pick you up from an incident or injury rate from that state's division of insurance. Okay? They make them out. Uh, we had one of our members is a manufacturer, probably more than they are a dealership. We had an inspection, what was it, Joe, two months ago? Probably a month ago? About a month ago. They showed up and they said, we're here because your injury rates from 2011 appear to be too high. They pulled the loss runs. No, we didn't. We have, we have good losses in 2011. They said, oh, okay, well, we want to look around anyway because we're here. So that's a possibility. You could see it. What are they going to look for? They want to know that everything's working. They're going to check the lift, make sure everything's working. They want to see that it's been inspected. They want to see that the employees have been trained, that you've got documentation on training on the lifts. If you use that checklist or other documentation to prove that the training was conducted, uh, they'll ask to see a invoice from the company that did the inspections. You pull that paperwork out. I'm sure everybody will have a copy of that. It'll probably still be in memory because they're not cheap, right? Probably 50 bucks a lift. Still cheap insurance, okay? They'll ask for an invoice. They'll ask for documentation on the training, and then they'll look at the lifts. That's really all that OSHA would want to know on uh, your vehicle list. They want to make sure that the uh, placards are there. All the labels are there. The warnings from the manufacturer are still on the lift also. Okay. The OSHA does not have a automotive lift standard. What they will do to you is they will pigeonhole it under 5A1, which is paragraph 5, subparagraph A, subparagraph 1 of the OSHA Act that says, as an employer, you have a responsibility to provide your employees with a safe and healthful workplace. See what that does to you? Anything they deem as a hazard, they can prove as a hazard, they can put it under 5A1 regardless of whether or not they have a standard for it. Okay, in Missouri, average citations for a serious penalty in 2013 was $2,500. Uh, OSHA has since increased their fines. I think it was around 2013 they did that. They actually increased it four times. Because they went to whoever they went to and they said, we haven't had a fine increase in 25 years and we think employers are still hurting employees. So we need a four times increase. A repeated or willful violation used to be 70,000. Now it's a possibility of 250,000. Mm -hmm. So if they show up, that's what they're looking for. Okay, I want to include that. So if you have a vendor or somebody comes in and says, OSHA's coming to check your list, <coughs> not right now. There's a possibility they might be, but there's nothing going on right now with OSHA on this. And then AOI again, Automotive Lift Institute, we've talked about that, located in Cortland, New York. There's a phone number, information website. 
if you want to go out there and check out some of their information. They do have a safety video that they've produced that comes with all new lifts. If you've bought a new lift within the last three to five years, you'll get an ALI video. Starting in 2015, they stopped producing the video. They've gone to an online version. So we bought one, Joe watched the video, Joe took the test, after he took the test for 30 bucks, it quit working. So I've got 10,000 fixed operations employees. I can't go to ALI and say, I want you know, what, $29 instead of 30 for 10,000 employees. Could you imagine that? I was hoping for a video, but if you bought a new lift, you've got that video. I'd really recommend that you guys take that video or you find one and have all your employees watch that. Okay. Questions, comments? Bottles to throw or rocks to hurl? So they do not, the OSHA doesn't require you to have a lift inspection. OSHA would require you if they came out. Yes. Um, can everybody hear Russell's question? Russell's question was Does OSHA require you to have an inspection every year? Directly, no. Because there's no standard from OSHA that says your lifts have to be inspected once a year. But what they would do is they would come out, they would probably dovetail to the ANSI standard and the manufacturer's recommendations that the list be inspected once a year, deem it as a hazard and write you a 5A1 violation for that. And there have been some big OSHA fines. Uh, has anybody ever heard of Executive Coach in Springfield? This was several years ago, so I'll throw them under the bus. I mean, you can go to the OSHA website and get information on them. It's all public record. There was a guy working on a limousine. The arm was in the way of a bolt. And he decided it was a good idea to take a three pound hammer and move the arm just a little bit. And it fell and crushed it, killed it. Okay. OSHA did an inspection. They got a $50,000 citation from OSHA because some of the safety latches had been removed. And they basically, I don't remember all the details, but basically OSHA proved the management knew about that and management allowed that to happen. And that was probably 15 years ago. So imagine what $50,000 today would be. I don't even know. So one last thing in your handouts, folks, is a critique form. If you would be so kind as to fill that out, we've kind of changed the style a little bit. I like the, I kind of like the white piece of paper approach. Tell us anything you like, didn't like. You know, you want a different speaker, better jokes. You know, speaker smell, speaker, speaker smell slutty or something like that, I don't, whatever. Uh, write down, or, 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 you know, future topics. What did we do good? What would you like to see in the future? Um, any kind of comment that you feel is pertinent, we'd appreciate that if you leave us some thoughts on uh, how we did this morning. Uh, we'll even take the good reports back to Jeff City. Yeah. <laughs> the bad one's like, I don't know, boss. I'm sorry, nobody left the bad one. So.